Hello, friends, family, Romans, countrymen. My name is Jill. Many of you might know me as Miss Neeland, but today we're friends, and I'm going to read you chapter 45 and 46 of The Ichabod by J.K. Rowling. So let's begin. There we go. All righty. Chapter 46, The Tale of Roderick Roach. You might think Bert would be terrified at the sound of these words, but believe it or not, the voice filled him with relief. He'd recognized it, you see. So instead of putting up his hands or pleading for his life, he turned around and found himself looking at Roderick Roach. What are you smiling about, growled Roderick, staring into Bert's filthy face. I know you're not going to stab me, Roddy, said Bert quietly. Even though Roderick was the one holding the sword, Bert could tell the other boy was far more scared than he was. The shivering Roderick was wearing a coat over his pajamas, and his feet were wrapped in blood-stained rags. Have you walked all of the way? From Shoeville, like that, asked her. That's none of your business, spat Roderick, trying to look fierce, though his teeth were chattering. I'm taking you in, Beamish, you traitor. No, you aren't, said Bert, and he pulled the sword out of Roderick's hand. At that, Roderick burst into tears. Come on, said Bert kindly, and he put his arm around Roderick's shoulders and led him off down a side alley, away from the fluttering wanted poster. Get off, sobbed Roderick, shrugging away from Bert's arm. Get off me, it's all your fault. What's my fault, asked Bert, as the two boys came to a halt beside some bins full of empty wine bottles. You ran away from my father, said Roderick, wiping his eyes on his sleeve. Well, of course I did, said Bert reasonably. He wanted to kill me, but n now he's been killed, sobbed Roderick. Major Roach is dead, said Bert, taken aback. How? Sp Spittleworth, sobbed Roderick. He came to, to our house with soldiers and nobody could find you. He was so angry father hadn't caught you. He grabbed a soldier's gun and he... <sighs> Roderick sat down on a dustbin and wept. A cold wind blew down the alleyway. This, Bert thought, showed just how dangerous Spittleworth was. If he could shoot dead his faithful head of the Royal Guard, nobody was safe. How did you know I'd come to Jeroboam? Bert asked. Cankerby from the palace told me. I gave him five ducats. He remembered your mother talking about your cousin owning a tavern. How many people do you think Cankerby's told? Asked Bert, now worried. Plenty, probably, said Roderick, mopping his face with his pajama sleeve. He'll sell anyone information for gold. That's rich coming from you, said Bert, getting angry. You were about to sell me for a hundred ducats. I did, didn't want the gold, said Roderick. It was for my, my mother and brothers. I thought I might be able to get them back if I turned you in. Spittleworth took them away. I escaped from my bedroom window. That's why I'm in my pajamas. I escaped from my bedroom window too, said Bert. But at least I had the sense to bring shoes. Come on, we'd better get out of here, he added, pulling Roderick to his feet. We'll try and steal you some socks off of a washing line on the way. But they'd barely taken a couple of steps when a man's voice spoke from behind them. Hands up, you two are coming with me. Both boys raised their hands and turned around. A man with a dirty, mean face had just emerged from the shadows and was pointing a rifle at them. He wasn't in uniform, and neither Bert nor Roderick recognized him, but Daisy Dovetail could have told them exactly who this was, Basher John, 
Ma Grunter's deputy, now a full grown man. Basher John took a few steps closer, squinting from one boy to the other. Yeah, he said, you two will do. Give me that sword. With a rifle pointed at his chest, Bert had no choice but to hand it over. However, he wasn't quite as scared as he might have been because Bert, whatever Flapoon might have told him, was actually a very clever boy. This dirty looking man didn't seem to realize he'd just caught a fugitive worth 100 gold ducats. He seemed to have been looking for any two boys, though why, Bert couldn't imagine. Roderick, on the other hand, had turned deathly pale. He knew Spittleworth had spies in every city and was convinced they were both about to be handed over to the chief advisor and that he, Roderick Roach, would be put to death for being in the league with a traitor. Move, said the blunt faced man, gesturing them out of the alley with his rifle. With the gun at their backs, Bert and Roderick were forced away through the dark streets of Jeroboam until finally they reached the door of Ma Grunter's orphanage. Whew. This is a tough one, you guys. Pretty intense. A lot of climactic moments here. Let's see what happens next. For chapter 47, Down in the Dungeons. The kitchen workers in the palace were most surprised to hear from Lord Spittleworth that Mrs. Beamish had requested her own separate kitchen because she was so much more important than they were. Indeed, some of them were suspicious because Mrs. Beamish had never been stuck up in all the years they'd known her. However, as her cakes and pastries were still appearing regularly at the king's table, they knew she was alive wherever she was. And like many of their fellow countrymen, the servants decided it was safest not to ask questions. Meanwhile, life in the palace dungeons had been utterly transformed. A stove had been fitted in Mrs. Beamish's cells. Her pots and pans had been brought down from the kitchens and the prisoners in neighboring cells had been trained up to help her perform the different tasks that went into producing the feather light pastries that made her the best baker in the kingdom. She demanded the doubling of the prisoners rations to make sure they were strong enough to whisk and fold and measure and weigh, to sift and pour, and a rat catcher to clean the place of Vernon, and a servant to run between the cells, handing out different implements through the bars. The heat from the stove dried out the damp walls. Delicious smells replaced the stench of mold and dank water. Mrs. Beamish insisted that each of the prisoners had to taste a finished cake so that they understood the results of their efforts. Slowly, the dungeon started to be a place of activity, even of cheerfulness. And prisoners who'd been weak and starving before Mrs. Beamish arrived were gradually fattening up. In this way, she kept busy and tried to distract herself from her worries about Bert. All the time the rest of the prisoners baked, Mr. Dovetail sang the national anthem and kept carving giant Ichabod feet in the cell next door. His singing and banging had enraged the other prisoners before Mrs. Beamish arrived, but now she encouraged everyone to join in with him. The sound of all the prisoners singing the national anthem drowned out the perpetual noises of his hammer and chisel. And the best of it was that when Spittleworth ran down into the dungeons to tell them to stop making such a racket, Mrs. Beamish said innocently that surely it was treason to stop people singing the national anthem. Spittleworth looked foolish at that and all the prisoners bellowed with laughter. With a leap of joy, Mrs. Beamish thought she heard a weak, wheezy chuckle from the cell next door. Mrs. Beamish might not have known much about madness, but she knew how to rescue things that seemed spoiled, like curdled sauces and falling souffles. She believed Mr. Do Dovetail's broken mind might yet be mended, if only he could be brought to understand that he wasn't alone and to remember who he was. 
And so every now and then, Mrs. Bemis would suggest songs other than the national anthem, trying to jolt Mr. Dovetail's poor mind onto a different course that might bring him back to himself. And at last, to her amazement and joy, she heard him joining in with the Ichabod drinking song, which had been popular even in the days long before people thought the monster was real. I drank a single bottle and the Ichabod's a lie. I drank another bottle and I thought I heard it sigh. And now I've drunk another, I can see it slinking by. The Ichabod is coming, so let's drink before we die. Setting down the tray of cakes she'd just taken out of the stove, Mrs. Beamish jumped up onto her bed and spoke softly through a crack high in the wall. Daniel Dovetail, I heard you singing that silly song. It's Bertha Beamish here, your old friend. Remember me? We used to sing that a long time ago when the children were tiny. My Bert and your Daisy, do you remember that, Dan? She waited for a response and in a little while, she thought she heard a sob. You may think this strange, but Mrs. Beamish was glad to hear Mr. Dovetail cry because tears can heal a mind as well as laughter. And that night and for many nights afterwards, Mrs. Beamish talked softly to Mr. Dovetail through the crack in the wall. And after a while, he began to talk back. Mrs. Beamish told Mr. Dovetail how terribly she regretted the kitchen maid, what he'd said about the Ichabod. And Mr. Dovetail told her how wretched he'd felt afterwards for suggesting that Major Beamish had fallen off his horse. And each promised the other that their child was alive because they had to believe it or die. A freezing chill was now stealing into the dungeons through its one high, tiny barred window. The prisoners could tell a hard winter was approaching, yet the dungeon had become a place of hope and healing. Mrs. Beamish demanded more blankets for all her helpers and kept her stove burning all night, determined that they would survive. Wow, what a story of hope love, friendship, and survival. Let's see what happens next on our next installment of the reading of the Ichabod brought to you by the Shed Theater and friends. Take care, good night, and be well.